right. Hey, everybody. How are we doing today? My name is Hank Schles. I am a director of global security campaigns here at Lookout. And welcome to another episode of Talk Data to Me, where we talk about all things data security. Uh, joining me today is Christina Balaam, who's one of our most tenured security, uh, sorry, senior threat researchers here at Lookout. Um, and Christina, as always, great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Hey, you know what? Th th thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, advanced persistent threat groups or APTs. Uh, Christina here has spent a lot of her time uh, at Lookout tracking APTs. So in my opinion, her insight on you know how they're evolving and what you can do to protect yourself uh, is, in my opinion, uh, invaluable. So we'll kind of roll into it here. Um, I think the first thing that's important to do is acknowledge the fact that I think people typically think of APTs as these sophisticated state-sponsored threat actors that are you know, executing cyber espionage campaigns against adversarial nation states. And uh, some of the more famous ones that people may have heard of are uh, the Lazarus Group out of North Korea, uh, Fancy Bear out of Russia, um, Elfin, which is based in Iran, and then Dynamite Panda, which is one of my favorite names, um, out, of, uh, out of China. But you know, we're, we'll, we'll talk about some of these groups, but also uh, one thing that Christina will kind of get into here is how there have been kind of some shifts over the last few years. Um, a couple of those are, you know, the fact that these groups are being more frequently uh, found to be responsible for enterprise level attacks. Um, another one is that we're seeing other organized cybercrime groups that aren't necessarily state sponsored. They're not yet at that status of being an APT. But they're kind of copycatting a lot of these tactics as they sort of trickle down the the, the funnel a little bit. Um, and then finally, we're seeing a lot more inclusion of uh, mobile as an attack vector uh, in these uh, APT campaigns. So, Christina, I'm going to take a breather here. Um, why don't you share a little bit on your, of your perspective kind of about APTs, uh, what you've seen maybe during your own research and a little bit more kind of about their their intentions. Yeah, sure. Uh, sounds good. So yeah, APTs um, stands for Advanced Persistent Threats. Uh, like you said, they're sophisticated cyber groups. They're often controlled by or sponsored by nation states. Uh, what's kind of interesting about some of the naming is, so you mentioned like Fancy Bear. Uh, typically, the naming corresponds with the, the country of origin or where the group is located or perhaps who is sponsoring them. So Bear typically applies to Russian APTs. Um, Panda typically applies to Chinese APTs. So something to keep in mind if, if you see like some of the naming uh, throughout the, your you know reporting that you're reading. Um, but you know we we typically see APT groups using just a bunch of different techniques uh, that kind of range in things from custom malware, which we don't typically see as frequently with your kind of like lower level cyber criminal organizations that might buy something off the dark web or your individual actor who just wants to make a quick buck through ransomware, again, who might go to the dark web. Um, they tend to use social engineering in the case of uh, APTs that are very well funded. So let's say that they are sponsored by um, a nation state actor that is, is you know, well resourced. Uh, we will likely see them use zero or end day exploits. And typically these are for cyber espionage purposes. And um, sometimes, you know, like you mentioned, cyber criminal organizations that are copycatting APTs. Um, sometimes we'll see them use these for financial gain as well. And their objectives really kind of range from things like gaining unauthorized access to a particular network that could be an organization, private or public sector, um, stealing valuable intelligence or intellectual property, which could be really valuable for certain organize, uh, for certain nation state actors, um, especially if you think about you know some some countries that might rely on kind of these hacker groups to to make money for the state. Um, that is one really interesting angle that we see APTs take. Um, you know, often they'll be trying to inject malicious code into a company's product or even to conduct targeted surveillance on a particular individual. And, and there was this really interesting stat from, uh, from PublicSec, and they found that actually 34% of companies experienced reputational damage as a result of an APT attack. So, you know, in, in addition to all of the other damage that a, uh, a private sector organization could experience from yeah. these kinds of attacks, uh, reputation took a big hit as well. So something to keep in mind. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, one of the interesting things you brought up there is um, 
the is using the APT as sort of a, a, a financial gain tool. And so you think about some of the countries we just we just named and, uh, you know, sanctions against them or, you know, maybe they don't have the strongest economy in the world. Um, so right. maybe they target maybe they're a group out of North Korea that loves targeting American banks or something like that. And, um, <laughs> you know, they do that from time to time. Um, so uh, with all that in mind, you know, you, you started to hint at this a little bit before, but what are kind of the beyond just reputation? Because reputation is obviously important, right? But when it comes to, you know, data, money, general security of the organization, what are some of those implications of APTs on the private sector? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, these attacks can have a, a really significant impact on the private sector. Um, you know, it could be anything like an economic impact to that reputational damage discussion that we just had. You know, if you have customers that are believing that their data or or your product is vulnerable, they might stop using your product. Um, and that can have a huge implication for, for a company, for your stock price, for, you know, all of that. Um, and then there's also the risk of supply chain interruptions and even, you know, like regulatory uh, compliance issues if, if you're the victim of, of, of an attack like this that is quite substantial. Um, if we look at one example, there's this APT group, APT41. It's kind of infamous at this point. It's uh, sometimes called Double Dragon as well. They're a Chinese APT tied to state-sponsored espionage and financially motivated cybercrime. So they're a really interesting group because they've quite successfully dipped their toes into both areas. Uh, we don't typically see that. We typically see an APT group that's like, really focused on espionage, really obviously state sponsored, or somebody who is very financially motivated and kind of more in that cyber criminal organization realm. Um, so APT41 is quite interesting because they've been successful across the board. Um, and we've seen them target a really wide range of both public and private sector organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like governments, software development companies, computer hardware manufacturers, uh, healthcare, telecommunications providers, social media companies, video game companies, kind of anyone they thought they could compromise, they just went for. Um, and and they so they have this track record of, you know, compromising both private and public sector organizations. And they were actually indicted by a US grand jury in 2019 and 2020. And in the reporting from, you know, the part of that indictment, uh, they actually found that APT41 had compromised over 100 public and private organizations and individuals in a number of different countries. So, you know, United States, um, Australia, Japan, Singapore, South Korea, India, Taiwan, they just really were very successful all over the place. And our team here at Lookout recently made a discovery that tied APT41 to uh, two new mobile tools that we've called Dragon Egg and uh, Worm Spy. And, you know, even though this group was indicted by the US government in 2020, they haven't really slowed down. You know, we're seeing this kind of focus on, on using mobile tooling, which we have seen throughout different APT groups introducing this kind of like mobile component to their campaign. Um, and, and it really is showing that, you know, what used to be kind of a focus on traditional endpoints um, has now turned to seeing mobile endpoints as a, as a much more high value targeted. And, uh, and you know, there's coveted data there for, for these groups to acquire. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, it's, it's not just the, the data on the, on the device itself, right? It's, it's using right. it as the, you know, you talked a lot about social engineering before, um, especially, I mean, like you said, that can, that can be costly. So, you know, if you've got, if you've got a government behind you, you can obviously spend the money to, to really create convincing campaigns and, and then it becomes a question of uh, compromising credentials and, and using that as sort of the way in. And, and as we've seen a lot here at Lookout, and we're kind of seeing more just across the industry, is that uh, mobile phishing is becoming more of a problem. And we could do a whole other session on that. Maybe we will, but let's <laughs> we'll stay focused on uh, on on the topic here for today. So, uh, you know, next piece here, kind of a two two parter um, about uh, actually protecting yourself against these APTs. So. So step one or question part one, there we go. Um, you know, what do you think the best approach is to protecting yourself against these attacks that, and whether it's the APT itself, or like we mentioned at the start, some of these uh, more advanced groups that are kind of copying or, or using APT tactics as, uh, as influence on what they're doing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the important things that we, that we need to remember is that 
mobile devices often lack the same level of security controls as those traditional endpoints. So they've become this increasingly vulnerable target for APT attacks. And I think for a while, your average consumer and perhaps you know enterprise as well didn't really consider their mobile devices a target for attacks. They didn't really see them as like a valuable um, attack vector for these APT groups. Thankfully, I think that seems to be changing and there seems to be a growing awareness from both consumers and enterprises that there is a pretty significant risk of having insecure or unsecured mobile devices um, you know, either connecting to your network or being used by your employees because of all of those different risks. You know, social engineering can sometimes be easier on a mobile device. Um, sometimes people aren't necessarily being as conscious about the things that they're doing on their mobile phone as compared to say, you know, I think most people understand now that desktop computers are prone to malware and, and so that's, there's a little bit more awareness there. Um, but to ensure your security operations aren't really blind to these like mobile specific attacks in particular, you really need some kind of intelligence driven defense. That's something that combines both, you know, the ability to threat hunt within your corporate environment and then consistent and up-to-date intelligence on this evolving landscape. I mean, things are changing constantly and you need something that can really keep up with that. And, you know, you know like we've said, organizations often have those capabilities for traditional endpoints, um, but we're really seeing mobile devices being leveraged as that initial access vector uh, much more frequently in these attacks, uh, especially from APT groups. So I think we need to keep in mind that because mobile devices are being leverage to access really valuable data, to compromise employees, to gain access to certain, say, networks that maybe they shouldn't have access to. Um, and, and, you know, also you have to kind of, kind of consider like the compliance requirements that might um, impact your organization. It's just keeping the, the mobile aspect in mind when you're implementing a security policy is really important. Yeah, I think that's really, that's critical. And you look at how, uh, you know, a lot of these compliance requirements in particular are expanding to specifically call out mobile. Um, right. One that I always remember off the top of my head is like there's it, within HIPAA, I know for, for healthcare organizations in the US, there they specifically call out because so many people access, uh, you know, electronic uh, health records, EHRs, EMRs uh, on iPads in the hospital and also sometimes at home. Um, and so, right. you know, specifically, so, you know, it, it makes sense, right? Rather than carrying around a folder of all your patient records, you're gonna have it on an iPad, it makes a whole lot more sense. So including those types of devices in those compliance requirements is, is becoming more important. So um, last thing, cause we're kind of running up on time here, like keep these to about 15 minutes or so, um, is sort of part two. So thinking mm -hmm. about uh, more about kind of the threat landscape, right? What What's sort of, uh, how is that evolving? And, and again, in terms of protecting yourself, what can be done to sort of strengthen those defenses? Yeah, so, um, you know, like, like we've talked about it, I think it's important to recognize that if you're part of the private sector, uh, your organization needs to be protected against these kinds of APT attacks. I think at one point we often saw nation state activity and, and a lot of these APT groups not necessarily exclusively targeting, but kind of like the stories you saw most frequent, frequently were, um, you know, attacks against public sector organizations, healthcare, mm -hmm. government organizations, um, targeting of journalists, dissidents, activists, that kind of thing. And and so we've seen a lot of those stories front and center. But you know, like we've talked about, there there is um, there is motivation for these APT groups to also target the private sector, and the ones that have have been very successful. And so I think it's really important that um, organizations think about this, are mindful of this, and really safeguard their companies against these kinds of attacks. And the mobile campaigns are often tied to these attacks nowadays in this threat landscape because it it really is evolving. We're, we're seeing so many threat actors who were at one point kind of singularly focused on traditional endpoints, really expanding their campaign to be multi-platform, to have you know, mobile components as, you know, in addition to conducting network attacks and, you know, distributing desktop malware, like they really are trying to do everything they can to be successful with the campaigns that they're launching. And, you know, when we look at attacks, like what we talked about with APT41, it's it's really illustrating that these, these groups are ready to attack other nations, private companies, basically whoever they can to um, to accomplish their goal, whatever that goal may be. And we're seeing those goals kind of more frequently shift from again, like pure espionage activity to 
you know, financial support for a particular uh, government. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, can, it can really be quite um, diverse, <laughs> the ways that these organizations are trying to accomplish their goals and what those goals even are. And so, you know, we've talked about how mobile devices are increasingly being leveraged by these APTs and the financially motivated threat actors that are kind of copycatting APTs um, and kind of belong to that cyber criminal organization. But we're seeing it be much more um, easily accessible. The, the mobile malware is much more easily accessible for, you know, the kind of the latter of that group, the cyber criminal organizations who are looking for ways to make a quick buck, whether that's through like ransomware attacks that do actually target mobile devices or, you know, um, surveillanceware banking trojans that are being used to target individuals of, of a particular organization. Um, it's just, it's no longer enough to just have coverage for traditional endpoints and threat vectors. So it's really important that an organization, um, you know, if you're part of an organization that's responsible for considering your security um, approach or your policy, making sure you have a solid approach to also securing mobile devices in your organization is, is really important because we don't suspect that this is going to slow down at all. In fact, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing a very significant increase um, in, in the ways in which mobile devices are, are being viewed as, as really attractive targets for a lot of these groups. Couldn't have said it better myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's all the time we have to, uh, for today. So Christina, thank you as always for, uh, for joining us. Thanks for having me. It was great being here. Yeah. Yeah, always, always, always a fun time. Um, and then for those who, who tuned in, thank you for uh, for watching. Um, if you want to learn more about what we've been talking about here, um, there's actually a link in this post. Um, goes a little more deeply. It's a blog that uh, I believe Christine actually wrote, um, kind of going a little more deeply again to this into this topic of really why uh, enterprise orgs should should really be paying attention to what APTs are doing and talking a little bit more about uh, the discoveries that Christina's team made around APT41 and um, all sorts of other fun uh, fun resources there. So thank you for, for joining us on this episode of Talk Data to Me, and we'll see you guys soon. Thanks.